So, um, if you want to catch up with any of the series that we uh, are doing, uh, or we've looked at, things we've covered, you can find all of them um, on our video casts, on our teaching, uh, on our YouTube page. And um, I thought, actually, I was going to put this up on the screen, but I don't think I've done it. I, I copied the link down here, which is no good for you, is it? Um, but if you click on our website and go to um, our sort of resources and click on sermons, you'll see it will come up anyway. Uh, Maxine does a wonderful job of editing that. So you can look at our um, video casts of what we've been teaching on. You can look at our audio, because obviously we didn't start doing video casts uh, until, uh, until COVID time. That was one of the good things that COVID, it brought us a little bit up to date. And uh, all of our audio stuff that was before COVID, you can hear back to January 2017. So there's a huge resource uh, of teaching on them from me and from other people um, as well. Oh, that's why it was quiet. That was stuck in the wrong place. Good stuff. So we're going through this series on the book of uh, Romans. If you're visiting and you're wondering, this is, this is where we're up to. Uh, we're doing verse by verse. And that normally means uh, that it, it takes a little longer than just doing kind of topical sermons. It also means, or one of the blessings it means, I find as a preacher, is that you just have to tackle whatever comes up next uh, in the passage of Scripture. You can't skip it, or at least not if you're doing uh, verse by verse authentically. And um, so if you uh, listen to this um, and you get upset by this, or it challenges and takes a nerve or something... Um, this is not me thinking, how can I get at the congregation today? Because I don't do that anyway. This is about what God is wanting to say to us in the book of Romans, and we just happen to be uh, where we are. And last week, we looked at, um, uh, we started this kind of section in chapter one, and Paul's explaining why we need the gospel. Why do we need the gospel? Why the good news? Why the reason for Jesus uh, coming to earth? What, what was the problem? Because once we know the problem, we know um, and can apply the right solution. So last week we ended with Paul saying that uh, man uh, gave up worshipping God and was drawn into worshipping idols. And this week we're going to see the consequences of that. Um, So hopefully, if my assistant remote controller works, look at that. We're going to crack into Romans 1, 24 uh, to 32. And maybe you've read ahead with this already. If you're making notes, I should say, if you ever want to take a photograph of the screen... Please do so. I won't think you're taking one of me. You don't want one of me. You want one of God's word. So just take a picture of the screen. That's that's fine. Romans 1, 24 to 32. Let's read through it. It says this. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. Some versions say uncleanliness. In the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting." Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unliving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice these things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Someone said to me uh, yesterday when uh, at the boot fair, and a great job done by Wendy and John and uh, Robin Nicole and Etienne and Esme, I think that was it, oh Dan as well was there for the boot fair, it was fantastic, but one of the uh, the people at the boot fair said, what positive thing have you got to encourage us tomorrow in the service? This. This. Um, (laughs) Sorry. As I say, it's not not uh, doesn't seem very encouraging. I said to them, I said, just wait until we get to the conclusion. It'll be hopefully a little bit more positive. But we've got to go through it. So let's break this down and see where we go. And remember, the blue text uh, it says at the bottom is the literal translation, and the black text for some reason it doesn't say it down there. I don't know what's happened to that. Is the New Living Translation? New Living Translation is a paraphrase. It deals with the meaning, the general gist, the meaning of the passage, whereas the New King James is a direct translation, translating the Hebrew, the Greek, into um, English so we can read it. So let's break this uh, verses 24 and 25 down. It says this, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their heart, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. 
Now, when you see the word therefore, whenever you read that in scripture, okay, look back at what came before. Sometimes we start passages of scripture uh, with, with a word like therefore uh, and because of and things like that. And we, what you need to do when you see that is to read back and say, therefore, therefore what? What has gone before? Because of something that's happened, something's been written about, there is a result. There is an action that follows. That's what the therefore is about. And if you read it back, it puts things into context. And it's always important when you're reading God's word to study around the verses you're looking at, not just pick a verse because it happens to sit your situation. Uh, that's how we take things out of context of the Bible. So always look around at what God is saying as you're studying God's word. Um, and uh, that'll avoid you falling into the trap of proof text. You see a text and you think, oh, that suits my view. Um, but that may actually not be, be what it actually means when you look at it in the context of the whole. Therefore, God also gave them up to their uncleanliness. So therefore, because of what we looked at last week, and I'm not going to go into that because I'm sure you were here. If you weren't, go look at it on our YouTube page. Because of that, God also gave them up to the uncleanliness. Now, people sometimes struggle with this because people will say, well, how can a God of love, a God of care, God of mercy, how can he give people up to go on sinning when he knows that sinning is wrong? He doesn't want us to sin. So why would he give us up? to go on sinning. But actually, we, we sometimes can think that it's his kindness, it's his mercy that allows people to go on sinning. Sometimes we think, okay, we're doing this thing which is sin, but we're going to go on doing it because God's kind of, God's loving and he's kind and he's merciful and he'll, he'll cast a, a you know, blind eye to it or he'll just gloss over it. But actually, it's his wrath that allows us to go on sin, uh, sinning. And you remember last week we talked about that, how some Christians will believe that got God's wrath doesn't exist anymore because they would quote that famous song, the wrath of God was satisfied. They will talk about how Jesus took God's wrath on the cross. And you remember we did that uh, illustration, which may have hit the mark, it may not have, with an umbrella. And we said if the umbrella represented Jesus, and if we come under Jesus' authority, we're Christians, uh, we're under his protection. If we're outside of the umbrella, um, then we're not under his protection, and therefore um, uh, we're still um, at risk of, 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 of the sins of the world, and we're not under Jesus' protection. Jesus took on the wrath for our sins. So I, when I came to Jesus Christ, age eight years old, I came under the protection of Jesus. I confessed my sins. Jesus paid for my sins. He took God's wrath for my personal sin upon himself. If I'm outside of the umbrella, should have brought the umbrella again in, shouldn't I, this week? If I'm outside the umbrella, then I haven't asked God or I haven't asked Jesus for that forgiveness. Therefore, I'm still subject to the wrath of um, God. Now, when people reject God's plan, his best, his laws... There is a consequence. And people say, oh, but God, he just wants to ruin my fun. He wants to control me. No, 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 no. A God of love doesn't want to control you. He wants to say, this is bad for you. This is good for you. If you live as I would have you live, then you're going to be living the best life, an enjoyable life, a safe life, a protected life, a life that is a life of blessing. If you live doing what you're doing, you're going to end up in all kinds of mess. It's, you know, it's, we, we have to understand what God is saying. We have to understand that God is the God of love. He doesn't want us to fall into the trap that comes with a life of sin because he knows that a life of sin is motivated and, and behind that sin is the devil. He knows that when we sin and when we do things our way, we are at risk of attack from the devil and all kinds of things that can result in that. If we follow and live as Jesus would have us live, then we're going to live a life of um, where we're protected under him, where the wrath of God for our sin has been paid, where we're going to live a life of uh, blessing. It doesn't mean difficult times won't come, but it means we're living a life of God's blessing. Let's go on. Uh, it says, in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, to exchange the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Honey, can you go and get my ju juice? No, it's all right. Sorry, at my office, I left it. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going. So here Paul begins to tell us what's happening. What are the consequences of disobeying God? What are the consequences of turning our back on God and his plan? The consequences are lust, dishonor of their bodies, exchanging a, um, uh, a life of truth from God for a lie. And John eight forty four tells us that the devil is the father of lies. Okay, And they worship and serve the creature... Satan, if you like here, rather than the creator, who of course we know is God. Now what is the lie? What, are they, what is this lie that they serve? 
The lie essentially is idolatry. What is idolatry? It's making an idol of something. Instead of serving God and worshipping God, people make um, idols of various things. If you go back into the Old Testament, you remember when Moses was up on the Mount Sinai, and uh, he didn't come down for a long time. The people thought he died, so they made an idol. What was it? It happened to be a golden uh, calf. You know the story. Um, but actually, we often do that in our own lives. We make idols of things. Maybe that's money. Maybe that's a career. Maybe it's our family. Thank you. Maybe it's an unhelpful habit. And we make things um, into, into idols. So the, the lie really is idolatry. Instead of worshiping God, worship God, they worship the idol. Who is the idol in this case? Themselves. We can worship ourselves. They're the idol. Their lusts, their passions, their desires. That's what they wanted to follow. Not what God had for them, but what they wanted for themselves. You know, <clears throat> when we move away from the teaching of the word of God, we are in a world of trouble. Did you know that? When we move away from what God's word says, we are in a world of trouble. And so often, Christians will move away from what God says because they don't like it. It doesn't fit with their ideas, their views. They get upset about it. It kind of challenges them. And so they're like, well, we're not going to accept that bit of the Bible. We're going to, we're going to, we're just going to forget it says that, or we're going to reinterpret it so it doesn't, it doesn't hurt so much. It's not as much an offense to us. But actually, God's word, the message of the gospel, is an offense. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And people don't like the fact that you tell them they're sinners. You know, has anyone ever come up to you and said you're a sinner? People don't like it. Um, they challenge you about it. It's not nice, is it, when we realize when we've convicted of done, when we've done something wrong. You know, when that time when you were driving down the road a little bit faster than perhaps you should? And a policeman stopped you and you're like, you don't like it when you get in trouble, do you? Speaking from personal experience. Um, I didn't get a ticket, but I won't tell you how. Um, I'm not proud of it, all right? It was, I think I've right, no, I forget that, right? I'm going to go off on a tangent. Um, we, if you were a child and you, you, you nicked something, an extra biscuit, when you weren't supposed to, out the biscuit tin or a chocolate, and you were found out and you get told off and the little bottom lip, lip starts to quiver, right? You see it with kids now. We don't like it when we get told off. We don't like it when we like to get away with stuff. Um, and bear in mind as well that sin is exciting, okay? There's, there's a, a lot of sin is exciting, otherwise we wouldn't do it. We'd stay miles clear of it, but it draws us in, it sucks us in. And so when we move away from the teaching of the word of God, which sometimes will speak conviction into our lives, it will challenge us on some of our views, then we're in a world of trouble. And I don't mean trouble as in a slap on the wrist. I mean trouble as in we are in grave danger. Have you ever walked across um, mud or sand that you think is solid, and then as you walk on it, you start to sink, and it starts to actually suck you in? I don't know if you've been in that position. And you can't get free. It's extremely hard to get free, and you very often need the help of someone. That's what I'm talking about. Sin sucks us in, and we have little control over its power, just like sinking sand will suck you in or sinking mud will suck you in and it, it's like it, it it's like it has power it's like someone's underneath pulling you down right it's that sin uh, has that control to suck us in and draw us in that's why sometimes it's so hard to let go of sin we confess our sins before god and then we find ourselves doing the same thing again and then we confess it and then we do it again there's that cycle of sin because it sucks us in it has power over it and we need to recognize that power and also recognize that jesus has the power to set us free from those things. But we need to be willing to allow Jesus to set us free uh, from those sins. Verses 26 and 27 says this. <clears throat> Paul goes on, he says, For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Remember, he didn't give them up because of his kindness and mercy. It was his wrath. God gave them up to their vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Hopefully you can figure that one out. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. You know, Spurgeon didn't believe this should be for public reading, this verse. This is what he said. He said, this first chapter of the epistle of the, to the Romans is a dreadful portion of the word of God. I should hardly like to read it all, though, aloud. It is not intended to be used so. Read it at home and be startled at the awful vices of the Gentile world. Okay, was, what was he saying? That this shouldn't have been written? No, no, he just, Spurgeon was struck by the gravity of what Paul is, is starting this letter with. Was Spurgeon right not to read it aloud? 
dare I argue with the great Spurgeon? I'd say no. Nevertheless, uh, do we read this scripture and tremble at the awful vices of the gent Gentile world? And remember, if you're sitting here going, well, we're not part of the Gentile world. Yes, you are. If you're not Jewish, you are classed as Gentile. Or do you read it nonchalantly? Do you sort of think, this is horrendous what we're reading here. This is, is this really what happened? Is this how sin had led them and sometimes leads us into these terrible places? Or do we go, well, that was then. That, it didn't apply then. It, it's been interpreted wrong. It, it's okay, actually. How do you read this first passage? I hope you read it and tremble. It says, God gave them up to their vile passages, uh, passions. Uh, now, remember the context Okay. Always remember the context when you're studying the Bible. What is the context? What is it saying? When was it written? Who is Paul or the writer saying it to? What was he saying? What was historically going on at that time? So Paul is writing to Rome from Corinth. So he's not in Rome. He's in Corinth. And in Corinth, all sorts of sexual immorality and ritualistic prostitution was freely indulged in. Sexual immorality, idolatrous worship was rife. And in Corinth, stood the temple of Aphrodite, dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite. Hopefully that will start the little grey cells working in your minds. And uh, this temple was famous for temple prostitution. Aphrodite is the ancient Greek goddess of sexual love and beauty, identified with Venus by the Romans, and she was known primarily as the goddess of love and fertility. So part of the act of going to this temple and worshipping was to have sex, whether they had separate little booths or rooms that people went into, whether they would just act it on the floor, I don't know. But this was the context that's, that Paul is writing. He's writing to the Romans, but he's in Corinth. He no doubt heard about Rome and the, and the sexual depravity in Rome as well. But he's very mindful of what's going on in, in, uh, in Corinth and uh, this sort of this, this, uh, how sex and, and lust and passion had taken over worship. There wasn't worshipping Christ, they're worshipping idols, worshipping themselves, worshipping um, Aphrodite and the Romans, Venus, the goddess or goddesses of love. Paul goes on, he says, For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful. You know, <clears throat> this is one of the passages in Holy Scripture that condemns homosexuality. And it's important to note that in that day and age when Paul was writing, they, as I understand it, I only learned this a few months ago, they didn't have the word homosexuality. That word, they, they, there wasn't a word uh, for it. So uh, it's, it's now been translated, the, the original, what it was original in Greek and what originally it was talking about, of course, in the Old Testament Hebrew um, uh, now we put this word homosexuality and very often when you look back in Greek and Hebrew they had um, like one word which meant a sentence in English right so you, you have to bear that in mind um, and so those people today who are affirming that means they agree with and promote and are happy with same-sex practice will say that actually this is a mistranslation the word homosexuality shouldn't be in there because in Greek and Hebrew they didn't have the word homosexuality they argue that what Paul is addressing here in this letter to Romans and um, addresses elsewhere in Scripture, Corinthians is one passage, Leviticus is another, there's a couple of others. They, what they say Paul is addressing is the sexual abuse that was happening, not consensual, loving, committed sex within a relationship. Their argument, people's argument, is that things like temple prostitution, that's what Paul's talking against, against pederasty. Uh, pederasty. That means uh, men having sex with young slave boys, which is very common in Rome. They argue that what Paul is condemning here is sex based on domination and exploitation. That's what Paul means. They say Paul is not talking about in a committed, monogamous, same-sex relationship. That, they say, is okay. Paul is talking about abuse, domination, exploitation, rape, all that kind of stuff. However, Whilst clearly that interpretation is gathering pace and acceptance in mainstream church today, and if you didn't realise that, you've had your eyes closed, even with some Baptist Union churches, we're a Baptist Union church, I would respectfully argue that this is actually a misinterpretation to permit and approve what the Bible says is sinful. So people have misinterpreted. They've said, oh, this homosexuality is wrong. They say Paul is talking about abuse. He's talking about rape. He's talking about pederasty. He's talking all about that. That's what it's about. It's not about true committed love. That is a mistranslation. That is uh, wrong. 
saying that God allows male and female homosexual activity is wrong. Whether that is conducted in a forced or abusive situation, whether it's conducted in a consensual sleeping around situation or in a committed, monogamous, loving, same-sex relationship, it is wrong, period. That's what the Bible says. Don't get angry with me. This is what the Bible says. Now, Paul uses the term natural and against nature. Natural and against nature. Or against nature, you could um, say is unnatural. Okay, it's, it's the same thing. Natural or unnatural against nature in these verses. Now, if we say that homosexual activity in whatever guise is unnatural, I have discovered that people get extremely upset and challenge you when you say that. <laughs> have you ever found yourself when you're talking about homosexual activity and you say, oh, it's unnatural? People get uh, quite, um, uh, quite feisty when you say things like that. Okay. Um, but that's what God calls it, okay? Again, don't shoot the message. I'm just telling you what God says, okay? I happen to believe what God says, let me just say, okay? But it's unnatural. The Bible uses the term unnatural. So if you use the term unnatural, you're quoting the Bible, and that's okay. Remember, all scripture is inspired of God, right? It's like written by God. People, humans like you and I sat down and we wrote the Bible, but it's like God had hold of the, the pen, as it were, and guided what was written. So there is no error in Scripture. Sometimes we think there's error. Sometimes um, we think, uh, oh, that doesn't make sense. That was for today. God writes Scripture. And 2 Timothy 3.16, if, if you doubt me, says this. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, that's what the Bible says. Now, I'm not going to go into this whole uh, area of teaching on homosexuality any more than, than this, really, because it, <clears throat> it's, it's way too big to do justice to uh, as a topic this morning. But I will say that my first master's essay, uh, which I uh, completed a while back, was around this area. I had to create, I, I did a pastoral and theological reflection, and I had to um, come up with a scenario that was current in the church and look at it from a pastoral and theological reflection. And they said, if there isn't anything that's particularly, you know, uh, to, that, that you can write 6,000 words about, actually, which isn't as long as you think, um, you're allowed to create a hypothetical situation. So I created a hypothetical situation. And my hypothetical situation was this. I had quite a lot of fun. It was like being a novelist. Um, a hypothetical situation was this. Two ladies walk in. Both One is a uh, lawyer, one is a legal secretary. Uh, they have had uh, a young son who is about one year old, if I can remember, through um, sperm donation. Uh, they're in a same-sex partnership. They've come into the Acorns Parent and Toddler Group, um, and they love what we do here. They come into the church, and initially the church think they're sisters or friends. Then it turns out that they are in a same-sex relationship with this child, um, and the bottom line is, can they feel welcome in a church which generally, and I had to make an assumption here, uh, generally... Um, would say that um, homosexuality is against God's plan. The Bible speaks against it. Could they, as a same-sex couple, be part of a church which, which has this view, that same, or certainly my view at pastor, is that same-sex activity, uh, relationships, whatever, uh, is wrong? Could they feel welcome? Could they stay here? Could we, as a church, welcome them in? Okay, it was a really interesting essay. If you want to read it, um, now it's been marked, um, I'll, and I've got a merit for it. So. Um, I'll, um, <laughs> not that me. No, 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 no. No, the, you can uh, you can go and read it. Just don't correct me on any spelling interpretations, okay? Um, I got enough correction for that, okay? But that was my master's essay was in that area, and I'll tell you what, it was really helpful to read people's biblical interpretation arguments for and against homosexuality because very often we will read what we agree with right what we're comfortable with and because of this essay and because it's a master's degree i have to engage with material that i wouldn't necessarily agree with and i tell you what it was fascinating to look at that and what it meant was i didn't look at it and go on oh, that's rubbish i looked at it and and critically analyzed my view why do i think what i view what what my views on on homosexuality why do i do that is it just because i was brought up like that is it because it just it's like uh, or was it because actually this is what god's word says sorry i'm or, or, you know what 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 was the reason what was the motivation why do you hold the views you do and it's important to look at that and so actually looking at arguments for and against it really helped me to to understand the pain that a lot of these people same-sex couples go through the pain the rejection by churches um, by families. Actually, in my scenario that I wrote, there was rejection from one of the, um, one of the ladies' uh, families, hypothetical. Um, and if you want to know what my position personally is on this, and I would say for SCF, go and listen to the sermon from the 21st of April this year, entitled All Are Welcome. 
Right, let's move on. Uh, Paul goes on and he says, and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error uh, which was due. What is the penalty they receive in themselves? What does that mean? Well, obviously, the lack of truth and peace that comes from abiding in God's will and purpose. If you're not abiding in God's will and purpose, you're not going to have uh, you're not going to have truth and peace in your life, right? Okay. But I also wonder whether in themselves does that mean? I'm just throwing this one out there, so we're learning together here. Does that mean physically and mentally? So Paul's just listed here. Talk, he's talked directly about homosexual activity, men with, um, with men, women with women, etc. Uh, what does he mean when he says uh, the penalty uh, was in themselves? Does it, does it, does it mean something else? I, I just looked at this. I'm throwing this out there for you. In the University of Washington News on the 21st of, uh, sorry, 24th of August 2017, there was an article entitled Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Older Adults Suffer More Chronic Health Conditions Than Heterosexuals Study Finds. It says this. I'm going to read these two because I want to put it in context. In general, lesbian, gay, and bisexual, LGB, Older adults were found to be in poorer health than heterosexuals, specifically in terms of higher rates of cardiovascular disease, weakened immune system, and low back or neck pain. They were also at greater risk of some adverse health behaviours such as smoking and excessive drinking. Interesting. Also, another article from the BBC News, dated 6th of July 2021, entitled LGB, and of course now there's LGBTQI. They are... <laughs> They add a letter every year, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, uh, this article says, um, LGB people are more likely to have mental health issues. And it says this, lesbian, gay and bisexual people are more than twice as likely as heterosexuals to have a long-term mental health condition, an analysis of NHS data suggests. They are also more likely to drink heavily and smoke, the report says. About 2% of people said they were lesbian, gay or bisexual in the 2011 to 2018 health survey for England. The findings confirm well-established health inequalities for LGB people, say rights groups. Of the adults surveyed over the eight years, 1,132, or 2%, identified as lesbian, gay or bisexual. Participants weren't asked about trans status or gender identity, but this is being considered for future surveys. About 16% of LGB, res LGB respondents reported having a long-term mental or behavioural disorder compared with 6% of heterosexual adults. LGB people also reported lower average mental well-being scores than heterosexual people, with LGB women having the lowest score of all groups. They were also more likely to drink more than the recommended units of alcohol. One third of LGB adults drank more than 14 units of alcohol a week, an amount which, in inverted commas, put them at increased or higher risk of alcohol-related harm compared with a quarter of heterosexual people. Just two articles, okay? Now let me follow this up very quickly, okay? By saying that all behaviours which go against God's word, God's best for us, his creation, carry consequences, okay? You may be heterosexual, you may be straight, um, and, and you drink too much, maybe you're alcoholic. That carries serious health consequences. Maybe you're taking of, uh, excessive prescription or illegal drugs, right? So don't listen to this and go, you know, Ross sort of quoted this article that said it's only LGB people, TQ, I plus, sorry, I forget it all, that have these, these health conditions, okay? There are lots of things in life that give us health conditions if we're not living uh, properly, okay? I want to set that in context. But I'm just, I'm just sharing that. I'm just wondering, is that p all or part of what Paul means where he says receiving in themselves the penalty? Maybe it's this, maybe it's more. We can discuss that later. Verse 28, let's um, go on. Oh, hang on, sorry, I'll put those up there. Um, and I didn't... There we go, verse 28. Sorry. Um, and Paul goes on, he says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. The word debased, or uh, reparate, if you read in the King James Version, originally meant that which has not stood the test. It was used of coins that were below standard and therefore rejected uh, in the Roman world. The idea is that since man did not approve to know God, they came to have an unapproved mind. So because they didn't approve of God and follow God, they had an unapproved mind. Their mind was led astray by other things. Kenneth Worst said, the human race put God to the test for the purpose of approving him. So in other words, we, the human race, decided we were going to approve God, right? Even the audacity of that is beyond words, right? 
So the human race put God to the test for the purpose of approving him. Should he meet the specifications which it, the world, laid down for a God who would be to its liking? And finding that he did not meet those specifications, it refused to approve him as the God to be worshipped or have him in its knowledge. In other words, mankind wanted to approve God who approved of what they wanted to do to live the way they wanted to live. And because God didn't, they effectively rejected him. They rejected the truth. They rejected the light. Jesus Christ is called the light of the world. And they worship anything else which they approve of, which at its root is the devil, is a lie, is darkness. Okay? And sometimes people will say to you with homosexuality, they'll say, oh, but the, the, the reason they struggle with the sin, you talk about alcoholism, well, of course, that's bad for your health. Drugs is bad for your health. Lying is not good. And they will list a whole lot of things. But, but, but homosexuality, well, that, if, if it's done the right way, they say, in a monogamous way, well, that's love. How can love uh, be bad? How, how can that? But you see, the devil takes what God says is good and twists it, right? Sex is good in the right context, in the way God designed it. But when it's taken outside of what God can't, it's twisted, and yet it still looks like love. But actually, at the root of it is the devil. Behind the scenes, if you like, pulling the strings, if you want to think of it like that, is the devil. And the devil is called the father of lies and his father of darkness. Let's, we're coming to the end now. Verses 29 to 31 says this. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. We could spend a week on each of those. That would take us 23 weeks to get through. So forgive me if I'm not going to do that, okay? Um, but go ahead and look at that list. Okay, this, this, is the, this is consequence of rejecting God. Here Paul lists these things. And following mankind's own sinful ways, these, this is the consequence of what comes. When you don't go with God, when you don't journey with him, when you turn your back on him and reject him as God, refuse to live as he calls you how to live, these are the, these are the consequences. Oh, they've gone up there. What's happened to that? Um, these are the consequences of um, what happens. Go back. There we are. These are the consequences of what happens. Let's jump on to verse 32. Sorry, I'm going to and fro. There we go. When you reject God, that, that's what you're going to end up with, okay? And, and what I would say is, um, I've just got, let me just go back again. Sorry, I just want to make, emphasize this point importantly. Just look at those things, okay? Make a note of it, take a photograph of it, there, and go and ask yourself, is there any of those things in your life? Okay, because it's easy to say, well, I'm a Christian, there's nothing of that. But, you know, as Christians, we can allow those things into our lives, okay? We may be... Uh, free from the wrath of God insofar as we've asked Jesus into our life, but sometimes we can give the, give the devil a foothold when we allow some of those things to come into our heart and into our mind. If someone upsets us, we can, uh, we can hold um, uh, feelings of, of uh, well, evil-mindedness. Sometimes that will come in. We can, we can hold um, things. We can be disobedient to parents because we think we know why. Uh, when people upset us, we can, we can hold things against them. We can be unforgiving, um, and we give a foothold. That's one of the worst ones, let me tell you, unforgiveness. Um, but, yeah, that's, we'll come back to that another day. Verse 32, as, as we round this off, says, Paul goes on. He says, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And Paul here shows the futility, the, the ridiculousness. I wish there was a stronger word. Maybe there is. Of mankind. This is the depth to which the human race is lost in depravity and abject poverty of soul and spirit. I wrote that. I love that. The lost in depravity and abject poverty of soul and spirit. That knowing the righteous judgment of God, knowing the consequence of their actions, that God said this was wrong and this is what was going to happen, um, they, they, they approve, they, they do the same things. They, they do those things that God says and they approve of those who practice them. So people commit these sins and they approve of those who do them. They don't say, I'm doing this, but please don't copy me because it's not good for you. Instead, they say, I do this and you're joining me. Hey, that's fantastic. Let's sin together. That's effectively what they're saying. It's just uh, unbelievable that, that Christians, um, and, and certainly the world does that because it doesn't know any better, but sometimes as Christians, we can, we can get, especially with gossip. Uh, have you ever gossiped about someone? Yeah, don't put your hand up. But you gossip about someone, and it feels good. And you don't gossip to yourself. <clears throat> if you do, you're talking to yourself. You've got a problem. 
You gossip to someone else. You draw them in. Then you, both of you are gossips. And then maybe someone else comes in. There's a little group of you, and you meet for coffee. Um, ladies or men, I'm not discriminating. And you say, do you remember that situation? And you share for prayer. Have you got that? <laughs> share for prayer. Gossip, okay? That's one translation. Don't, share, don't put it like that, all right? You gossip about someone. You draw other people in, and you approve of those. I, I'm never going to do that. You say, well, um, I don't know. I, I've been part of churches that have done that and gossip about me, and I know that happens, and probably you too. So um, there's stuff for us to learn here. It's not just about what Paul's writing to Romans. So as we conclude, as we bring this into land this morning, I hope this is the positive bit for you. What can we take from this this morning? There's loads that we haven't been able to cover. God's word is so deep and incredible. Um, um, we could study this passage for months and we'd never get to the bottom of it. But firstly, by giving people over to sin, God is not unloving or uncaring, but it is part of his judgment, his wrath on mankind's willful disobedience and sinful choices. Remember, God and sin cannot coexist together. Secondly, living a life of a lie and of darkness has consequences. Physical, mental, spiritual has consequences. Living a life of truth and light brings freedom. Thirdly, based on these scriptures, we've seen how God does not view homosexuality, whether in a committed, loving, monogamous relationship or in an abusive, ritualistic, casual way, as natural. Okay? The Bible says it is not natural. It is in any and every way unnatural or against nature. It is sin. Verse 4. We, uh, sorry, point number 4. <laughs> we know that there is hope that for anyone who lives a life where they've rejected Jesus Christ and rejected what he says they should and how they, they should live, but if they turn and repent and follow him, they are forgiven and welcomed into the family of God. Amen? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all, don't point the finger. But because of God's love, if we turn and genuinely repent of our sin, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what God's word said. Fifthly, we know that God does not welcome perfect people. Whew. <laughs> Anyone up for that? He does not welcome perfect people. Other, if he, if, <clears throat> um, but he welcomes imperfect people. That's a relief when I got stopped by the police for speeding. Um, I was an imperfect person in that moment and in many other cases as well. God does not welcome perfect. He doesn't sort of say, well, you can't come in until you're perfect. He welcomes imperfect people. He does not welcome the sinless, but the sinful to himself. He does not welcome the perfect, but the imperfect. That should bring great hope, all right? Phew, I'm so glad about that. And lastly, that as Christians, God works with us and it helps us to deal with any of those sins listed, including homosexuality issues, gender issues, and identity issues. Can you be a Christian and be gay? Yes. Can you be a Christian and gossip? Yes. Can you be a Christian and lie? Yes. We can be a Christian and still commit those sins, but if we are truly repentant and we come before God, he will forgive us of those sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. And sometimes we'll, we'll genuinely seek his forgiveness, he forgives us, and then we get sucked into those things again. Remember what I talked about at the beginning, like sinking sand, sinking mud, sucks you in. Sometimes we need more than just, God, I'm sorry that I've sinned. Sometimes we need, we, uh, a big word here, deliverance ministry. Don't get scared by that, but sometimes we need people to help us to pray through things. Why? Because underneath that sin, sometimes there is a root that leads us to do that. And if you don't deal with the root... The weed comes back, right? That's why I love weed killer. Sorry if you're not into chemicals. I love weed killer, especially one like Roundup. It kills the root as well as the leaves, right? You've got to kill the root. Otherwise, the sin will resurface in your life. For the Christian and for the non-Christian, there is hope. There is help through the power of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. Um, Father, the... Someone shared with me earlier the word restoration. Mm -hmm. um, and Lord, I, I don't know who's, uh, in th those of us who are here, I can't see their heart. Uh, praise God, only you can see that, Father. For those watching online, either live or um, in follow-up, Lord, I don't know who's going to see this. But follow, I uh, Father, I just pray that that word restoration rings in our ears. That if we are repentant of our sin, whatever that sin is, we've, 
uh, touched significantly on homosexuality because that's what this passage was talking about predominantly. But, um, Father, all, all things that fall short of your standard, of your glory, uh, we need to repent of and get right. And you are a loving God who, uh, who as we repent and genuinely commit our, our sins to you, are faithful and just and forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Father, help us. Let's pray against anyone who might feel fearful of coming before God, of that thought that, oh, God will never forgive me if he knows what I've done. What I've done is too bad and phrases like that. Father, thank you that you do know everything about us. You saw us even before we were conceived in our mother's womb. All the days of our days are numbered before one of them has come to be, and you've seen every single thing about us. Um, and Father, you see everything we do, everything we think, everything we say. And so, Father, help us not to have that fear. And help us not to believe the lie that Satan so often sows into our heart, into our mind, when he says, if God knew, if people knew what you'd done, they would never forgive you. That is a lie, folks, if you, if you felt that as a lie. <coughs> Everyone has fallen short of God's standard. And yet because of Jesus' beautiful sacrifice on the cross, what was horrific and what the devil thought he'd won turned out to shame the devil and brought glory to you, Father, as you opened up the way again for mankind to come back into that righteous relationship, that right relationship with you. Father, I pray as we just continue in this time to do a work and as we go uh, back to whatever we're doing afterwards, Lord, that this, these words will ring in our mind that there is hope. The hope is in Jesus Christ. And Father, if we've struggled with any of the, if we do or have struggled with any of these things that we've looked at today, Holy Spirit, will you come and do a work in us to speak to us Show us the right path, the right way forward in Jesus' name. Folks, we have a, a prayer team. If anyone wants to receive prayer, I understand you. Because of what we're talking about, you may not want to come to the front. You can do if you want. Um, and we're not going to assume anything if you come to the front. Um, but if you want to um, pray with people, then the prayer team will be around. And uh, we'd love to pray with you. God wants to do business today. feel God's given me a picture it's like we're sitting here or if you're sitting at home wherever you are and it's like his love is falling like rain not kind of mist but you know those big fat drops of rain <laughs> but they're fat drops of love if, I, if, if you see my picture right there's not <coughs> he's not pouring out judgment he's pouring out his love remember what the Bible says why we were still sinners Jesus died for us. God has love for his world, for mankind. He wants to make you right. He wants to make you whole. He wants to heal up the brokenhearted. So just allow, um, just as the music that just plays quietly, we're not going to sing for just a minute. Let's allow some space for us to do business with God, just quietly to yourself. says he who has done a good work in you will carry it on till completion I just feel God's brought that word shame um, to my mind um, you know when we commit sin we can feel shameful and shame can be like a blanket that's draped over us you know those kind of heavy blankets you can buy that are supposed to bring you uh, to help to comfort you um, it's like this heavy blanket, but instead of bringing comfort, it's bringing shame. It's like it's wrapped you up and bound you and covered you. Father, if anyone here this morning is feeling that shame, we just break it in Jesus' name. Father, may your love just cut through that blanket of shame. It just falls, up, falls off and dissolves away in the power of your love. You don't have to feel shame confess your sin without action word deed God wants to restore you
plenty of programs on the television about restoration, the repair shop, that's one of the most famous. Things come in that are broken, that are damaged, that people think are beyond repair. And through the hands of skillful craftspeople, those things are restored. Jesus specializes in restoring. And sometimes Jesus uses a process like kintsugi. It's a Japanese word. It means in Japan when things precious like bowls, cups, whatever objects are broken, they stick those things back together and they use a glue that is that gold glue. And then when things are stuck and they're repaired, those lines where they were broken and they're stuck, that gold glue, still visible. And they become a beautiful part of that bowl, that cup, that item, whatever. Sometimes those scars from things that we've had may remain, but they change from being shameful scars to beautiful things because they're a testimony of what God has done for us. Other people might know or see those scars and they'll go, what was that for? And you can tell them, you can say, but Jesus did this for me. Jesus set me free. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this morning's service. It's been great to have you with us. I just wanted to very briefly share with you how you can give your heart to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. I became a Christian when I was eight years old at a kid's summer holiday club. And it was an amazing time. And I remember praying a very simple prayer and I remember the feeling in my heart, in my life, that I just had that feeling inside of me. Something changed when Jesus came into my life. And the great thing is that when we do it, when we ask Jesus into our life, he doesn't just add it onto his to-do list. It happens straight away, straight away. And it's just, it's, it's the best decision we could make in life. You can change the trajectory of your life when you ask him in. And when he comes in, he comes in to, to be your friend, to be your Lord, to be your savior, to be your helper in difficult times. And you know, I've been through some incredibly difficult times in my life, but I know that God has helped me every step of the way. Jesus has been with me every step of the way. And when I've had important decisions to make, I've prayed about them. And Jesus has helped me to make the right decision. When I've gone through tough times, he's comforted me and enable me to get through those difficult times where otherwise I probably would have taken another course of action, but he's helped me in those times. And so when I was eight years old, I remember praying a very simple prayer and, and the prayer involved just these few simple sentences. I asked Jesus to forgive me. I admitted that I'd done something wrong. I repented of my sin and I made that 180 degree turn to start following him. And so if you want to do that this morning, if you want to take that step, then I want to help you pray that prayer. So if you're ready for that now, let's do it now. So just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I have sinned. I recognize that I've done my life my way. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I repent of my sin. Please come into my life. I choose right here, right now to make that 180 degree turn and start following you and living my life the way you would want me to. Please come into my life be my Lord and Saviour. Amen. And if you've prayed that, then that's then fantastic. I'm so pleased for you that you've changed the trajectory of your life. You have made the most important decision you could make in your entire life. But I want you to do two things for me. The first thing is this. I want you to get in contact with me and let me know that you've prayed that prayer. And the reason is because then we can be accountable to one another we can support one another so when you send me an email the email address will come up at the bottom of the screen I can get back in touch with you and I can send you some some information to help you 
uh, on your journey as a new Christian. The second thing I want you to do is to get into a good church. Now, I don't know where you live. If you live in Milton Keynes, you're welcome to come to Shenley Christian Fellowship, or there are other great churches in this city that you can be a part of. But if you live at other places in the country, then I want to try and help you find the church to be a part of. It's important that we're part of a church which is welcoming, a church that teaches the Bible, a church that believes in great worship, and also a church that will help you on your journey as a Christian. We call it discipleship, but, but it's basically teaching us how to, how to live our life as a Christian. And so I wanna help you do that if I possibly can. So thank you for being with us this morning. I'm so pleased that you made that step, but if you haven't prayed that prayer and you still need time to think, then I want to encourage you to think it through. And I want to encourage you to pray and ask Jesus and say, can you help me in making this decision? Because he will do that. And, uh, and we, I just want to bless you this morning. So just take care and stay safe.